Welcome to another edition of the Art Marketing Podcast. And today we're asking the question, is it the greatest time ever to be an artist? Yes, it is. I want to make that case though. See what you think. Uh, why this episode? Why now? Thought this podcast was designed to be about hardcore marketing strategy and tactics. And it is, but we felt this was an important episode that lays a foundation that we plan to build on. Uh, we really hope that this episode gives you the why, the why you should be executing on the hardcore marketing tactics we go over, the why you should be working harder than ever, the why now is the time to take your art business to the next level. This is the reason that art storefronts exist as a business. That's the reason this podcast exists. We really do believe it is the greatest time ever to be an artist. So let me make that case and let's talk specifically about how the internet has changed everything, a little bit of history, a little bit of context, then let's talk about how that change applies to the art world. And then let's finish up with what we believe an artist should be doing to take advantage um, of this new world, this brave new world, as it were. And the internet really has changed everything, right? I mean, it's hard not to agree with that statement. It sounds cliche, but it's just so true. It has changed everything. It continues to change everything and will continue changing everything. And I think on what feels like a daily basis um, recently, the pace is really just like quickening, quickening, quickening. So let's talk some of the history, some of the themes, some of the terms for some context. I think regardless of what industry that you talk about, they all kind of have their own paths and some have been disrupted more than others. But let's let's talk about some of these themes that continue to emerge. And I want to I want to tease out some of the themes and some of the terms and then let's pull those from other industries and then let's apply them to the art industry. And I think as you get into this entire operation, if you will, the, the internet buzzword, the zeitgeist, the, the term that you hear the most often to refer to, whether it's businesses or technologies or apps, is this term disruption, right? Something came out that disrupted an entire industry. The classic examples, Amazon, when it first got started, completely disrupted the book business, right? The way that we buy books. Um, both online, offline, the games forever changed by Amazon. That industry got completely disrupted when they came on the scene. Bookstores all across the United States went out of business almost overnight, right? It, it, it comes and it swings a big hammer, this disruption. Uber with the taxi industry, the exact same thing. Came out of nowhere, forever changed transportation worldwide in just a, just a short period of years, right? Airbnb, same thing. All of these houses that were not available for rent, not widely available, not widely known about, are now available in countries all over the world that you can stay in. I've stayed in several of them. I, I love staying there at Airbnb's. So all three are the are the class some some of the classic examples people love to to reference when they talk about disruption. Some companies, if they're amazing enough, if they're if they're you know run by such visionary leaders, can actually disrupt individual industries multiple times. Classic examples: Amazon. What have they disrupted? Absolutely everything. An example I love talking about, though love love love, is Netflix. Right? Keeps things nice and simple. I like the rule of thirds. Do you realize that Netflix has been three completely different businesses, all equally disruptive? And that's a crazy thing to think about. Business number one. Let's call that bye bye blockbuster. Right? Netflix reinvented and reimagined the way that you might rent movies. And you know, some of you millennials won't even probably remember these days, but you used to have to go into Blockbuster, get your VHS tape or get your DVD, watch that, return it after the fact, pay these onerous late fines, and, and then have to waste the time doing that trip and everything else. Netflix comes along, completely disrupts that, and absolutely obliterates Blockbuster's business. And I think you know, one of the one of the one of the recurring trends in this whole entire disruption phase is the established player never sees it coming. I listened to a podcast just recently, and I the name of the lady escapes me. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the show notes, though. But she was HR um, of Netflix during during multiple phases of Netflix's business, and she said they used to listen to the blockbuster uh, earnings calls, right? And say, and, and this is why that they, they had already gotten gotten rolling. Um, Netflix had, and they were disrupting. Uh, uh, Blockbuster's business, and Blockbuster didn't even know it. They were they were so stuck in their old ways, caveman status, they didn't even realize it. And so they would listen to the earnings calls and be like, do they know about us yet? Do they know about us yet? Are they telling investors that we exist yet? And they hadn't. At the very end, like a last ditch effort, and it just, again, how clueless Blockbuster was, at the very end, before the, the ship completely sunk, they were out of business, they ended up copying Netflix biz, uh, uh, website verbatim, like copied it verbatim. And literally just changed the Netflix to the Blockbuster logo and used the, the Blockbuster colors. 
thinking that that was going to save them last ditch. And they just didn't even realize that they were so blown out. It was so far gone. Nothing would have saved them. So amazing story. That's business number one by by Blockbuster. Let's talk about business number two, the streaming business. And I want to introduce a term. You're going to continue to hear this going forward um, once you're aware of it, if you're not aware of it already. It's called all content OTT, over the top, which is really a broadcast term to say content created. The, you know, the traditional way was to go through a network. This way, you just stream it over the internet without, any, without anybody in the way. So OTT, you'll continue to hear it. I'll reference it more. But early on, Netflix started the streaming business, business number two, right? All of a sudden, everybody that had content was like, wow, look at Netflix. They have this incredible infrastructure. Let's give them all of our content. So all the movies, all the TV shows, not all, but you know, a, a, a healthy amount, a tremendous amount, ended up on Netflix. You could stream it. Massively disrupted, right? Massively disrupted. You know, all the early adopters started cutting the cord, saying, what do I need cable for? Let's let's just stream everything. New behaviors emerged out of this. Hello, binge watching. I mean, I had never watched an episode of The Wire. That show was amazing. I'm so glad I missed it because I was able to just binge through every single solitary season uh, in chronological order at my leisure. And I enjoyed every bit of it. But, you know, Netflix now, I think, available, by the way, 190 different countries. Anybody know of any blockbusters in those countries, by the way? Probably not. Probably not, right? But a massively disruptive phase, a, a phase that completely changed the game, changed the face of society. The thought of content streaming directly to your house, the utter total complete elimination, by the way, of DVD players and VHS. I mean, do you even need any of those things? Hello, Laserdisc. Bye-bye. So all of that is gone. Another massively disruptive phase the streaming business. And, and what's been interesting to see during the course of this business, which Netflix is still in, but is pivoting towards number three, more on that in a second, is during the course of this, everybody else that owned all the content, right, that owned the TV shows, that owned the movies, early on, they're like, this is so new. I don't like change. Change is scary, but let's just sign a deal with Netflix. We'll give them our content and we'll see how this whole thing pans out. Others saw the writing on the wall right away and was like, okay, we need to create our own streaming infrastructure immediately get on it. And others have just recently in the last like month, or two months, six months. I mean, I think Disney pulled all of their content from Netflix like six months ago, a year ago, and they have now the Disney Now app. But what happened was is that everybody realized, wait a minute, owning all the content is absolutely makes me king. So let me stream it. And so Netflix is, has, has slowly seen their streaming business and the number of titles that they have available decline because the original content creators are like, well, what the heck do we need Netflix anymore? Let's start peeling these things back a little bit. During the course of that, what does Netflix realize? Wait a minute, we're losing titles. Wait a minute, we now have 100 million subscribers. What in the Sam hell do we need those guys for? We don't. And so enter business number three of Netflix. Let's create our own content. We have 100 million subscribers, i.e. attention. How often do I love talking about attention? We don't need them for anything. And I'm sure that was a profound learning for them. We're not going to be held hostage by Disney or 20th Century Fox or Miramax or any of the rest of them. And so what do they do? Hello, House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, Narcos, Marco Polo. I mean, doing show prep for this thing. I just checked. Netflix has 29 original shows coming out in October. 29. I mean, that's crazy. So it's like we don't need to license no stinking content. We'll make our own, right? And this is just such an amazing and far-reaching trend. So that's business number three, by the way, that Netflix is in now. They're creating their own content. They are not beholden to anyone. They realize uh, uh, they don't need anybody to be wildly successful, and you're not going to let anybody have that type of control over you and, 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 and you know just weaken that aspect of your business. And everybody's following suit with this now, by the way. Amazon, um, despite the fact that their studio had just re resigned, embarrassing, but... Amazon's doing it, you know, uh, 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 Facebook's doing it. Hello, Facebook Watch. Uh, Apple's going to get into the fray here pretty soon. Even Snapchat and Instagram are part of this with this OTT type of broadcast video content um, direct to the consumers. And let me tell you, the cable companies uh, uh, that survive off of these bundle packages of content, you know, 200 channels are in a lot of trouble, which is a good thing, right? Everybody hates the cable companies. It's like the most hated company period ever. Um, anyone have anything nice to say about a cable company? You know, maybe if your wife works or your husband, but all right. The biggest takeaway in all of this though, if you have the content and you have the attention, hello, Netflix, hundred million subscribers, hello, Netflix, Orange is the New Black, Marco Polo, all the rest of it, you hold all the cards. You hold all the cards. You have all the power. What's the point in all this? Yes. The internet has absolutely changed everything. And oh, by the way, it's just getting started. And I think 
one of, if not my favorite theme, theme number two of this whole thing. So that was disruption. Theme number two that I love is the absolute obliteration of gatekeepers. Obliteration. Break it down to some industries. Let's talk about music. Back then, you needed radio airtime. You needed a record label. They were the gatekeepers in control of that. You would have to go, sign a deal, sign away your rights, give them your originals. You know, I mean, that business has been disrupted massively too, right? But that's how it used to be back in the day. What do artists doing, are doing now? They're recording. They're putting their music online. They're getting followers on their own. Then they're getting record deals. Just read about an artist. Uh, he's a hip-hop guy named Russ from Atlanta. I actually like his music. Uh, but it was an interesting story because he started putting all of his music onto SoundCloud, doing this, I think, for like seven or eight or nine years. Got up to 100 million downloads on multiple songs on SoundCloud that he did on his own with no record label, no help whatsoever, and started selling out concerts. And he started small. He started slow. He just started hustling and grinding out day by day. Just signed a record deal in 2017. And let me tell you, I'm sure those terms were quite favorable to him. The gatekeepers were forced to come to him on his terms. Amazing, right? Let's talk about audio. Spoken word content. Back then, if you wanted a radio show, yep, you guessed it, you were going to need permission from a group of letters that are either started with a W or a K, KBC, WABC, whatever the case may be. You would need a radio station, probably pay for airtime. What do you do now? You start a podcast in your bedroom. You have the potential to reach 100x what you would have if you even got on that one station or the two stations. Your antenna reaches worldwide. The airtime is either free or close to it. You just need to go and cultivate and get that attention. By the way, should be mentioned, here in the United States, um, I think one of the biggest radio station owners is iHeartRadio. They're on the verge of bankruptcy. On the verge of bankruptcy. Disruption going on there. But also no gatekeepers. Let's talk about video. What was it back then? It was a bus ride to Hollywood, and you probably ended up on Harvey Weinstein's casting couch. That sick son of a... What is it now? Now you turn on a camera and you start broadcasting yourself. You put your stuff on you put your stuff on YouTube. You start grinding at it. You get a massive amount of followers. And now the movie studios and the in the in the TV studios, they come to you and they say, We'd love to put something out. YouTube, Netflix, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. It's amazing what's going on in there. We could talk about print, but how boring is print? Yes, blogging has annihilated every form of print journalism um, that there is. Um, so this concept, it doesn't matter. It, it is regardless of the industry, the gatekeepers are either gone, they're on life support, or they are losing power by the minute. I think the biggest takeaway that you need to have from this, if there's absolutely no one standing in your way from what you want to accomplish, not like there used to be. Let's talk about the next trend. Number three, retail is absolutely getting destroyed, at least as we knew it. Um, this one's been happening for years now. Everybody's seen the effects. Amazon's responsible for a lot of it, yes. But even Netflix, I love Blockbuster. But the small shops, the mom and pop places are getting annihilated. Toys R Us just went bankrupt, I think, in the last like couple of weeks. Uh, the stats say that 25% of malls are going to be gone in five years. What are they going to do with all that real estate is the question. Uh, really, though, the doom and gloom stats aside, you read article after article after article about how much trouble the shopping malls are in, and they are headed for serious trouble. I believe they are. Yes, the strong ones will survive. They'll create experiences. They make awesome places to hang out. Some are going to iterate and do that and thrive. But a lot of them are going to go out of business and they're just getting, they're getting disrupted. They're getting destroyed. I think, you know, the traditional ways are just getting harder and harder in terms of retail, not ever easier. It's not something to get emotional about. Uh, change is happening. You just have to be aware of it, right? And now let's get out of retail. Retail is kind of boring. The next trend that's equally profound is the ability to reach more people than ever before at any time in history, and it's only getting better. Eight new internet users are added worldwide every single solitary second. You know, the, the data that we have internally on this is absolutely amazing. Orders coming in from every single solitary corner of the globe, web traffic coming from every single solitary corner of the globe. I mean, I think anyone that's active on Instagram and has a good following or a few viral posts can speak to this. Like, if you look and you run the analysis of where your followers and potential buyers uh, live, they are all over the world, everywhere. It's just amazing to even think about that. I was talking the other day in a, in a Facebook Messenger conversation, nice nice gentleman down in South Africa, an artist, and we were hammering messages back and forth on the phone in Facebook Messenger. You know, he's sitting in South Africa in some coffee shop in Cape Town, telling me about the, the, the art scene in Cape Town, South Africa in general, how he's doing in galleries, how he's selling online, the fact that, he, that he's not selling online, and the fact that he is kicking butt in the galleries. And, and, and we just had this, this conversation back and forth, and it was just, you know, no big deal. It's just a normal part of the day, which is just crazy. How could you possibly do something like that, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even seven years ago? 
So I think it's an amazing thing to think about. You know, you, you have the ability to reach more people than ever before. In, and this is, just goes more than just to artists. It's whatever business you're in. It's, it's, it's just crazy what the internet has brought to us. Now, I think underpinning so, so much of this, right, possible not to talk about this, are cell phones. The computers in our pocket that are with us 24 hours a day and always connected. In terms of all of the themes, disruption, obliteration of gatekeepers, retail getting destroyed, and the ability to reach more people than ever before, nothing has played, continues to play a bigger role than the phone, right? Everybody has one. Everybody spends a huge chunk of their day on one. It's the single biggest disruptor of them all. And boy, it is the early days. It's just getting started. Now, I think the great thing about disruption and all of these things really is that Every time it happens, it's scary, yes, but a myriad of opportunities open up if you're ready to capitalize them. The new currency in this world is attention. Perhaps it's always been. And those that know how to get it are going to win. Everything continues to change, but attention and, and, and the attention piece, it just never does. I mean, what's coming next? Hello, more cell phone, everything, the Internet of Things, which are all the devices in your home connected to the Internet. You know, hello, VR robots, AI chatbots, machine learning. Amazon Alexa, Google Home, Apple, Cortana from Microsoft, all of the stuff that's happening on with voice. And by the way, really quick aside, have you guys used Google Photos yet? If you want to see, it's, it's early. You know, a lot of smart people are saying really interesting things about, about AI and machine learning. The robots are going to come to get us and kill us. Whether or not that's the case, check out and for an early implementation of it that will immediately make sense to you. Sign up for a Google Photos account. Upload them 100 photos. Let's say you and I, we took a vacation to Hawaii. We went kayaking. And we went and got a sushi dinner after the fact. We can upload the thousand photos we took of those various different activities, let the Google AI and machine learning run through it, and then go into the search bar and type in sushi. And Google knows what a photo of sushi looks like and it'll show us all the photos of sushi. You can type kayak. It knows what photos of kayaks are and will show us all the photos of kayaks. You can type beach. It knows what a beach looks like and shows all photos of beach. Amazing, right? It, it knows as a result of machine learning and running through so many photos what those things look like and can automatically characterize them for you. And that's just one early example. So the change that's coming is just, it's massive. It's just getting started. It's the early days of all of it and the pace and the speed, it just keeps getting quicker and quicker. And it's, it is impossible to not say it is a remarkable time to be alive. I think people probably always say that regardless of what time they live in. And they're probably right, right? It's likely. But I think it really is just an exciting, exciting time to be an artist. So let's talk for a second about how all of this applies to the art world. And I think, you know, all of the aspects that we just went through, they all apply to the art world. Each industry, yes, goes through its own disruption and phases and chapters, whatever you like. But let's just, you know, throw some of the art stuff out there. You know, I, whether it was rich benefactors back in the day, some people still talk about that like it's a thing. Like, I think, was that 15th century Europe when that would happen? That model got disrupted. What about university or art endowments where that would pay artists to be full-time artists? Does anybody know anybody that's doing that anymore? What about the early days, you know, where art galleries were the thing, where art publishers were the thing? If you could get in their catalog, if you could get past those gatekeepers, you would kick butt, um, you'd be rocking, right? They kind of kind of got disrupted a little bit, didn't they? Um, what about art fairs? How many artists can we talk to that say that art fairs back in the day were kicking butt and at just a massive rate, really, really successful? And then since then, you, know, you could still do well, but you know, I, I overwhelming it's it's declined. It's been it's been on the wane. So I think what about the online marketplaces? Uh, art.com, Etsy, eBay, Sachi, Fine Art America, any of them. I think in the early days, um, there were some arbitrage opportunities to get there before everyone else, and it started working well. The vast majority of artists that we talk to, they're not working as well as they once were. They're they're on the decline. And it, and, it, and it really, you know, underpinning a lot of this in terms of our own individual intelligence is we just talked to so many artists over the last few years and nearly all of them point to one area or another, take your pick in any of those things where their business has been disrupted. It is not performing at the same level that it was in years past uh, because they were reliant on, on one of these individual sales channels and it's just not producing at the cliff that it was. We just hear that all the time. I think if you talk to any artist that's been in the game for a while, most of them, 99% of them, I feel like, would, would, would say something like that. I mean, I've personally responded to thousands, if not tens of thousands at this point, having been at this for a couple of years, of comments to artists on Facebook and Instagram about how these channels are just not what they used to be. So we talk about the themes, right? Disruption has happened all up and down uh, 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 the art world. 
Uh, we talk about no gatekeepers. You know, it, it, it just, it's just not, it's just not the deal anymore. You don't need an art gallery, an art publisher, or anyone who controls to hold you down. You can get on the internet. You now have the ability to reach more people than ever before. You know, the data we have on that is crazy. Um, and you can start grinding and get your own following and make your own sales. There's no gatekeepers. You have the ability to reach more people than ever before. 2013 was the first year where more art was sold online than off. Yes, plenty is still sold offline, but more art is now sold online than off. Retail is getting destroyed. Galleries are going out of business. There's less and less of them around. Uh, um, less art is being sold in malls nationwide. We talked about that. And yes, of course, the cell phone is changing everything in the art world, especially the amount of artists that are in their 20s that have harnessed Instagram alone while living in some place in middle America and are, are being successful is, is just striking. I mean, it's, it, there's just amazing data and stories out there. I'll put, it, I'll put a few in the show notes, by the way. Um, I've just read some incredible ones even just recently. So, so again, is it the greatest time ever to be an artist? You know, are, are, are you going to sit here and tell me that an art industry has been completely disrupted? that gatekeepers do not exist in the slightest, that more art is now being sold online than offline, that you can now reach more buyers across this country, across the world than any time in history, that you have the ability to reach this international cadre of buyers uh, on what is effectively a mobile billboard they're carrying around on their person or right next to them 24 hours a day, that if you learn to identify where this phone screen time is spent, hello, Instagram and Facebook, and, and, and you learn to storytell in those places, literally nothing is holding you back from being a consistently selling full-time artist, you know, as big as you want to be and as your talent will carry you. And I believe the answer to all of that is yes. Yes. So what's an artist to do? Great. Patrick, fine. I'll agree with it. And even if I don't agree with you, the internet certainly does feel like everything's changed. I get that. What am I supposed to do? What is an artist to do? And, and I think what we believe is that, that artists need to set themselves up to succeed. We believe we've entered a new phase in terms of the art world and art sales. And in this new phase, I mean, it's the reason why we exist. It's the reason why this podcast exists. So let me frame up what I think an artist needs to do to be successful in this new phase. In this new phase, you need to run your own art gallery. What? Let me come at that from two angles. One, think about the psychology of this. How are we trained to think about buying as well as viewing art? I would answer that with art galleries and museums. If that's the case, it makes sense then to design your online experience to mimic what we already have as established patterns in art viewing and buying. Do that and your prospects will be in the right frame of mind to purchase as it just feels right, right? There's psychology at play there. You know, I had a comment recently on Facebook from um, some gal the other day ripping the fact that all the art storefronts themes are usually white and minimalist. Of course they're white and minimalist. I wanted to respond and I let it go. I didn't respond, but they're meant to mimic art galleries. It's all about the art, not the site design. It tanks conversion rates when you have these big, pretty portfolio sites that have wonderful design that draw the attention away from the art. So it, it, it pivots to the next point, which is you need a proper art gallery website that is set up to transact commerce, that is set up to sell art. A pretty, a pretty portfolio site, really, business card site, has never gotten that done. You ask anybody that has them, how does that sales volume work out? You also need the back office tools. You need to run an art gallery online. Orders, framing, shipping, database, et cetera. All the nuanced stuff towards running what would normally be considered a brick and mortar gallery online, right? You need some marketing tools and a marketing strategy. Again, I get it. This might sound a bit biased coming from me. It's what we sell after all, but that is, it, it doesn't make it not true, right? It really is just true regardless whether you get it from us, the man in the moon. And, and it's not meant as a sales pitch though, so let's keep rolling. With your art online art gallery in place, you need to put in consistent and focused work on growing your traffic, your email list, your social following, i.e. attention that you own. Think Netflix and their 100 million subscribers. Good news here, you don't need 100 million subscribers. You can start by just getting 1,000 true fans. 1,000 true fans, start there. You already have those, start moving up from there and leveling up from there. I think in this new phase, you need perspective. And I think it's a fair assumption to say, overall, blanket statement coming, artists have lagged a bit when it comes to understanding the change the internet has brought and how to best take advantage of it. 
Not all, of course, but a large majority of this is true. You know, we talk and have talked and continue to talk to a tremendous amount of artists over the years. And everything from those just getting started to those who've been at it for years, in some cases, 20, 30, 40 years, in most cases, regardless of talent, regardless of the experience, even regardless of previous sales, most um, are digital newbies. You know, you've never run your own on art, online art gallery. You've never really had your own website that you've been very intentional about driving traffic at. You've never worked consistently at driving traffic or running ads or building an email list or building a social following. Yes, that's a generalization. Yes, there are some that have kicked butt at all of that. I get it. But overall, for most artists, that's the case. And so to take advantage of this next phase in art sales, you have to have the perspective that you are just getting started digitally speaking, and it's gonna take a while to get that momentum to get going. And that is a really hard one for most people because they've been selling art for five or 10 or 15 or creating art for five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, maybe even had some great success selling offline and art, and art fairs, but they have no social profile and they have no email addresses and they have no website traffic. When you come online, the internet is binary. It's ones and zeros. It does not give a damn about how awesome you've been at art fairs in the past or how much you've sold offline in the past or anything really that you've done in the past. Now, don't get me wrong. Those connections, that experience and those sales, those customers, it, you're going to be able to parlay that into some help. But still, digitally speaking, you're new. You're going to be a newbie. So you have to come in with the proper mentality that's going to take you a while to get things going, get the momentum and really start selling online. So you need patience, right? Nothing good is going to come overnight and it takes years and years of grinding digitally to get yourself into a really good place. And I think, you know, I hate the internet. I hate the internet, Instagram, hip hop music uh, uh, for this. It infuriates me. Why? Because it's a bunch of selfies, of luxury cars and hotels and pools and swans and drinks and champagne and stack of cash and private jets and Lord knows what else. And none of that is true, right? It's completely BS and unreal. And I think 99% of those people are faking it. It's just not real life. But that's the expectation, right? Like, what's up? I'm 22 years old and I'm getting on this jet this weekend to go to Vegas and I'm going to be at some nightclub. It's like, that is not real. That is BS. You're just getting your life started. You didn't achieve any of that. So anyway, the expectations is what, is, is, is what comes off kilter, right? Great stuff online. It takes time and it takes patience. You know, the, the, the flip side of this where we see it manifest, it's like, I'll see... New people come online and we have, we have this like Facebook group for our customers. And so there's back and forth in there, but you'll see people that have come online and they've been at it for like four months and they don't have any sales yet. And they're pissed and they're like, what? I don't have any sales yet. I'm four months into this. And so you start the conversation. It's like, okay, Steve, what have you done so far? And you get into a conversation about what Steve's done. And Steve is put in like three and a half hours worth of work and he can't figure out why he's not selling anything anymore. And it's like, dude, Fish do not jump in the boat. What world do you live in where the inputs don't equal the outputs? Like, that's just not the way that it goes. So you have to have patience. You have to come on board realizing that, you know, you're going to have to grind this out and get this going. But once you do, it's amazing. So I think the perspective and the patience, as Tom Clancy likes to say, an overnight success, 10 years in the making. you got to be patient. But when you mix those elements together and you come with the right mentality, and you realize that you have a lot of time left in your life to really make something like this incredible, um, you know, that, 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 that you set yourself to the task of marketing and getting better every day, and it's a game of pressure over time. That's it. You know, Peter Drucker once said that people often overestimate what they can accomplish in one year, right? But they greatly, greatly underestimate what they can accomplish in five years. And I think God, it's just so powerful and it's so true. And, and even more than just art, it transcends anybody attempting to, to do business online. Um, it's, the, it's, it's just the same rules for everybody. Uh, did somebody say something about the good news? And I would say this, there are a lot of things to like about an art business in this new world. In this new world, you get to decide when you work full time, 80 hours a week, you're going at it. You're, you're a thriving artist all the way down to like a side hustle in the margins of your life in the morning or at the end of the day, you can do both of those, put in work on the daily and continue to get better and get there. You get to determine where you work and anywhere will and can do, you know, whether you're grinding at home on the side, you're, um, you know, a roadie for a traveling band and grinding from the road, a different city every other night, or you're my buddy, Bill Stidham living in, living the dream in San Miguel Allende. It's all, all possible. It's also, inexpensive to launch something like this. You're not signing some two-year lease 
first and last in uh, a deposit for a building down on Main Street. You got to paint the walls and hook up the, the the business internet where they you know where they really take you to the cleaners. So I think that low overhead gives you a long runway to get your business up and running, make a ton of mistakes, start building momentum, put in the time when you can. You know, and it's all you. You're not as an artist that, that creates it yourself, you are not waiting on some injection molding to come back from China for six weeks before you can even think about creating your prototype and then putting all this money in to order it, to get it online. It's like, you guys create everything. You are 100% the product and you're not reliant nor dependent on anyone for anything. And I think I think that's amazing. Uh, your profit margins are crazy high as businesses go, right? Original art can be said to have profit margins of over 90%, prints on average can, you know, uh, over 65%. And ask around, most business owners would die for those margins, uh, except the ones that sell ink cartridges, damn tyrants are at the top. Um, somebody needs to disrupt the ink cartridge people, by the way, I hate them. Now then, it does not matter if you just created your first piece and you're 14 years old, or if you're 65 and you've been in the game for 35 years. The playing field, digitally speaking, is level. You can get started today and really start doing damage. I mean, it's a democratization of, of business, which is amazing. One further point that needs to be made is, it's not a zero sum game. Uh, let me emphasize that point again. I get this all the time. We get this all the time. And you know, we run all these ads on Facebook and without fail, you know, I constantly talk about that. You should see how much time I have to spend responding to these dog in the comments. But once a quarter, one, not even once a quarter, like once every two weeks, somebody will come on and you know, it's an ad. And so it's from a company and there's that perspective and they'll fire on like, I don't need this service. I don't need you guys. Uh, why would I need you guys? I'm, I've, I've been selling on Etsy for 10 years and I'm doing great. And, and I sold it in 190 countries last year. And, and I think, you know, I don't, I don't know where they're coming from, where they're leaving that statement, but they leave that statement. And I think they're like expecting me to, to come back with piss and vinegar. And I'm like, awesome. Amazing. Of course, if that's working for you, double down on it, triple down on it, start spending money on ads on Etsy. Can you do that? I don't know. I think you can. Um, look, the, the, the bottom line is, is I don't care if it's offline or online, whether it's a third party marketing place here, there, or anywhere, if it's an online gallery, offline gallery, whatever it is, if you've got something that's working, stay at it, write it, hit it as hard as you can, double down on it. Just make sure that it's in addition to and not in lieu of building your own following and your own customers and your own attention. You know, just make sure you are doing everything you can to peel as much of that attention away from those other platforms as possible to, to an area that you own, right? It doesn't matter if it's Etsy or Fine Art America or SachiArt.com. There is a reason that these people do not give you your the emails or the names of your customers and let you know who they are, let you email them directly. Notice that, notice that theme is, is interwoven with all of those, doesn't matter which one. You don't own those buyers. They're not yours. You're only renting them and the rental contact can be changed at any time at a whim and you don't control it. It's the whole reason that you need to own your own spot, own your own gallery. And, and, and you know, like everybody, everybody has some context on this. How many of you guys were infuriated uh, 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 when you made, spent all this time, energy and effort for people to come and like your Facebook page? And everybody saw all your updates. And then guess what? Facebook decided that everybody's not going to see your updates anymore. And everybody's arms went up in the air and were infuriated. How dare you? How could you do that? Everybody's saying the same thing on Instagram, even right now. I've seen a bunch of these comments, even just recently. And guess what? That, that, those likes are not yours. Facebook decides. You're on rental territory. Same with Instagram. Those are not yours. You don't get to decide. You also should not be emotional about it. You should know this going into it and you should actively be working to peel as much of that attention as you can to put these platforms to work for you uh, and, and, and drive those eyeballs to your site, something that you own, right? And I think the most rewarding part of all of this in my eyes is you're building your castle if you follow through with this, right? You're building your castle on land you own and you will own in perpetuity. It's your domain, your URL, you own it. It's your email list, you own that. No one can ever take that away from you. You've got the title in hand, nobody can foreclose, there's no loan, right? So once you start that grind, knowing that all of that is in place and knowing that you're building towards it, uh, it becomes an extremely, extremely rewarding process. And, and, and again, yes, this is true for art, but yes, it's true for any business that you start online. So what did Peter Drucker say again? People often overestimate what they can accomplish in one year, but they greatly underestimate what they can accomplish in five years. 
So that becomes the question, right? So what are you going to accomplish in the next five years? Yes, the internet has changed everything. It's going to continue to do so. The opportunity it presents, though, is tremendous. And I think not only are all industries going to continue to get disrupted, but the art industry especially. Hello VR, virtual reality, I think, in particular, is going to be huge for the art world as soon as it matures. You know, virtual art gallery displays that you're able to walk through, uh, let alone seeing people's art on the walls of our house with our cell phones, which is here now. But I think in order to take advantage of those opportunities, you need to be working incrementally towards building attention you own. You own. Nobody knows for sure what change will be coming down the pike, right? But running your own art gallery online, owning it all, and building the tension you own is the greatest hedge you can have against any disruption to come. So is it the greatest time ever to be an artist? The answer to that question, it's up to you.